Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. I got one of the things that I am most thankful for. By the way, if we haven't met, my name's Craig, and I'm one of the pastors here. One of the things I am um, most thankful for this Thanksgiving season is a few months ago, um, I asked my oldest grandson, Jackson. He's 18 years old. He's a freshman in college. He uh, has got a job and he's got a girlfriend, which means I don't get to see him nearly as much as I used to. So I asked him a few months ago, I said, hey, Jackson, would you uh, be willing to, to uh, have lunch with me once a week? And he said, yeah. And uh, we go to Pancheros. That's his favorite. Um, he hasn't asked me what my favorite is yet, apparently. <laughs> and uh, what do we do at these luncheons? Well, we, we eat Pancheros, number one. We, we talk about school, about life, his future. It kind of depends on, on um, the day, actually, or the week. But there is one thing about our um, luncheons together that is always consistent. I asked him when we started, I said, would you do Bible study with me? And I don't know if he was just humoring me because I'm his grandpa, but he said yes. And, and uh, we've been doing it ever since. Before we got started, I, um, I said to him, I laid a foundation for him about the Bible that I want to lay for you if you don't already know this. I said to him, and as I say it to you, I, the Bible is not primarily a history book. Now, it, it is history, but it's not primarily a history book. There's all kinds of history that is not in this book, right? No, the primary purpose of the Bible is to lay out for us God's plan to save the world. Which means, ultimately, the Bible is all about Jesus. Because Jesus is the plan to save the world. Now, in the New Testament, it's very easy to find Jesus. He's everywhere. He's very obvious in the New Testament. But I'm here to tell you this morning that Jesus is all over the Old Testament too. You have to dig a little deeper sometimes to find him, but he's there. The way I like to describe it, if you're a gamer, you'll understand this. Anybody a gamer? I'm not either. I just kept green kids. Okay. But there's... There are Easter eggs planted all throughout the Old Testament pointing us to our hope. And his name is Jesus. Our hope is named Jesus. Now, what is an Easter egg? Basically, in this context anyway, it's a, it's a, hidden, um, it's a hidden clue that points us to the hope. And our hope is in Jesus. So I share all that with you today. Because um, if you've been with us at all this year, you know that we, are, we have been on a journey through the Gospel of John this whole year, and we're going we're gonna to be doing it into the next year as well. But during the holiday season, we're going to be taking a hiatus from the Gospel of John, and we're going to delve into the Old Testament, the book of Ruth. Now, some of you may be thinking, that's kind of an odd uh, choice, for the, for the holiday season, for moving into the Christmas season. But I'm here to tell you this morning that this Old Testament book of Ruth may actually be the perfect lesson that you need to learn as we head towards Christmas this year. So if you have your Bibles... I want you to open them up to the Old Testament book of Ruth. If you didn't bring your own Bible, we got all kinds of Bibles... And if you're, Ruth chapter 1 is found on page 262. If you're using one of the church Bibles, if you're using your own Bibles, you're on your own. I want you to uh, uh, take uh, a moment. I really do want you to read it in a Bible because we're trying to establish holy habits here, discipleship. So you can read it up on the screen with me if you want, but I really encourage you to take some time to find this book and read it from the Bible and read along with me. Ruth chapter 1, starting at verse 1, it says this. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malan and Chilion. They were 
Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died. And she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they lived there about ten years. And then both Malan and Chilion died. So that the woman, Naomi, was left without her two sons and her husband. Happy holidays! <laughs> An uplifting passage of scripture for moving into the holidays. I don't know that there is a more uh, dark beginning of any book of the Bible, more dark than the beginning of the book of Ruth. It begins with the famine, right? A famine that is apparently so severe that a good Jewish man named Elimelech decides that he needs to relocate his family to the country of Moab, which if you know the history of the Jews and the history of the Moabites, that was not an easy decision to make. The Moabites, the, the Jews were given um, um, commands over and over again to avoid the Moabites because they were an arrogant and idolatrous people. They would, if you spent too much time with them, they would draw you away from God and the things of God. But a man's got to do what a man's got to do when he's taking care of his family. And apparently... The thing he had to do was to relocate he and his wife and his sons to the land of Moab. It's kind of a dark beginning, but it gets even darker. Because as we've learned, the man dies. Now, if there's a, a silver lining in that cloud, which I don't know how there really could be, but if there was a silver lining in that cloud, it was that by this time, his two sons had grown up. They've become adults and they're able to take care of themselves. And what's even just as important is that they were able to take care of their mom, who is now a widow, which is very important because this was a time and a culture where um, if you were a widow, the only way you could survive, there's only really two ways to survive. One was by begging. The other one was to trust that your family would take care of you. So she at least had her two sons, right? Two sons who, yes, had married uh, Moabite uh, women, which was maybe a problem in and of itself, because remember, they were idolaters. But it doesn't end there either, does it? Because both her sons, Malan and Chilean, both died in the midst of all this. And Naomi was left alone without her husband, without her two sons, a foreigner in an idolatrous land. All she had was these two daughters-in-law from um, families that worshipped false gods. But remember earlier when I told you that all throughout the Old Testament, there are these Easter eggs that there were these Easter eggs that were meant to give us clues about our hope. Well, right here in this passage of Scripture, we find one of those Easter eggs. Did you see it? It's right there in the first verse. Look at it with me again. It says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land and a man of Bethlehem. Isn't it ironic that this man and his wife and his sons happened to come from the same little town from which salvation would come into the world through a very unlikely source, a babe 
lying in a manger. We know that story like the back of our hands, don't we? It's probably the most famous story in the world, right? But listen to me. Naomi didn't know the story. All she knew was that her husband had died. And then both her sons died. And she was alone in a foreign land with no way to take care of herself except for these two idol worshipers. (laughs) That's all she knew. Well, she did know some other stuff. She knew that God was still on the throne. Now, how did she know that God was still on the throne? Because God said so. All throughout their, her history, her people's history, he was saying, I'm on the throne. I have a purpose and I have a plan. She knew that God was on the throne, had a purpose and a plan for her for her people, and for the world. She didn't know the details. You suppose she had doubts? Why don't you for a second put yourself in her shoes. Do you think you would have had doubts? I would have. I would have been a mess. I bet you would have too. But listen to me. In the midst of her mess, in the midst of her devastation, she still had a choice. To believe that God was still on the throne and that God had a purpose and a plan Now, here's where I go from preaching to meddling. Because you have the same choice. Some of you are here today, and you're in the midst of the mess. You're in the midst of the devastation. Some of you experienced the devastation maybe 10 years ago. I don't know. But all of you, at some point in the future, will experience some mess and some devastation. You know why I know that? It's not because I'm a prophet. It's because that's life. Life is messy. And sometimes it's painful. Sometimes it's so broken, you can't know, you can't even believe that I, you can make it. But you can You can know that God is on the throne. That God has a plan. And he's got a purpose for all this. You just have to trust him. Naomi had no clue what purpose and plan God had for her specifically. I mean, she couldn't have known, for example, that, she, that God's purpose and plan for her was that she was to become the great-grandmother of King David. That's pretty cool, isn't it? She didn't know that. She had no clue that she would become part of the lineage of the Messiah, of the Christ. but she would. Because God's still on the throne. And he's got a purpose and a plan for every one of us. We may not know, you may be sitting in the midst of your devastation today and thinking, I can't even begin to imagine how God could take this. 
and give it purpose. I can't even begin to imagine what God's plan is for this. But will you believe? Today, God is asking you to believe that he's got a purpose and a plan for you. And here's something that's going to freak you out. I know what your purpose and plan is. He's told me, and I'm not even a prophet. He has revealed to me, he's actually revealed it to all you too. I'm nothing special. That the purpose and the plan that he has for you, big picture, don't know the details, but I know the big picture. The big picture is that your purpose and your plan is to be Jesus to the world. And ironically, God so ordained that today would be the day that we would celebrate and remember your purpose and your plan through the sacrament of communion. You have been, if you believe that God is on the throne, that God has a purpose and a plan for your life, if you believe that, He has called you to be Jesus to the world. He has called you He's he's asking you to allow him to redeem your mess, your devastation. So that all of that might be used by God through you to bring Jesus to the world. 